uh, for the area. Um, so uh, between the two of us, we manage a, a lot of different aspects of the summer work travel program. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Bridge USA um, and the summer work travel program, a little bit of an overview on where the program stands today, um, how you can become a host employer if you're interested. Um, and happy to take any questions. You can either put them in the chat box or we'll have time at the end as well. So um, brief, brief overview of us. We're, as Tracy mentioned, a nonprofit. We're based in New York City. We have staff kind of around the country. Um, we've been running and administering uh, cultural exchange programs for over 50 years, um, partnering with the US Department of State um, as well as other stakeholders. Um, Summer Work Travel, the program we're going to be focusing on today, is just one of our programs. We have uh, an intern and a trainee program, which are a little bit more longer term programs for more professional development, um, a camp counselor program, an au pair program, and then we have similar programs for U.S. Um, students and, and non-students looking to go abroad doing similar types of programs. Um, we also have a foundation that provides grants for young Americans that have a uh, passion for improving uh, the world to do so on, on various service projects abroad. Um, the Summer Travel Program is part of the U.S. Department of State's uh, Exchange Visitor Program, um, which, the, which was um, created as part of the 1961 Fulbright-Hayes Act. I think many of you have probably heard about the Fulbright program. That was kind of the flagship program created under this act, but it also created a number of other different cultural exchange opportunities um, for international youth to be able to travel here to the US. Um, the Department of State partners with organizations like InterExchange to run these programs. Um, they can include universities, secondary schools, um, some government departments run their programs themselves business associations, public and private entities, and other nonprofits. Um, participants coming on this program all need a visa to come to the US and they're coming on a J-1 visa um, and they're applying in person at a US consulate in their home country. Most of these programs um, that fall under the Exchange Visitor Program run three to 12 months. A few of them allow uh, for slightly longer stays. And just to give some context um, as to the size of the Exchange Visitor Program, over 300,000 participants typically come to the US on a variety of different programs every year. Um, the Summer Travel Program, the one we're focusing on today, is the largest of those programs um, with, in a typical year like 2019, over 100,000 participants coming to the US and living and working in communities around um, the states. So uh, first and foremost, these programs were created uh, as a way to help increase mutual understanding between people of the US and uh, people of other countries by means of educational and cultural exchanges. So as you can see here, some, um, most of the some more travel part program participants are coming expecting to gain a cultural exchange experience. And they're also leaving with a vastly improved uh, view of America and having improved their English skills as well. And these programs really don't stop once the students leave your communities and leave your employee. They go home, they share those experiences, they create some lifelong bonds with some of your colleagues, um, some of your American staff and other friends that they've made here in the US. And that creates a bond between your community and their communities back home. And you know, it is often that we have students that have their siblings, their cousins, their friends, friends of friends that come back on the program and choose to come to the same community that they participated in a program with because they built up those bonds. So you might see students year after year that have you know, other friends that want to choose your destination, your business, and your community to come spend their programs. Um, and then, you know, these bonds go longer and longer, and they really do help build those ties between the US and other countries. One stat I like to share because I find it interesting among the millions of Bridge USA program alumni around the world, one in three current world leaders have participated in a cultural exchange program in the US. So these programs really are critical for our national security interests, for our public diplomacy. And they also do help our local economies by bringing new cultural perspectives to each of your communities and by helping uh, support seasonal businesses in their peak seasons um, while they need. Um, 
students coming on the summer travel program come for three to four months. They work, they travel, they get to a month, up to a month of uh, travel time at the end of their programs. So they can work for typically three to four months in the US and then they get a month of travel time at the end of their programs where they get to go sightseeing around the US, visit all the destinations. They all wanna go to Niagara Falls, New York City, Vegas, Hollywood, you know, all the top destinations. Some of the students have uh, larger ambitions and do road trips uh, through all the national parks. So really, you know, the students can kind of create and tailor their own end of the end of the program experience. Um, and a portion of their expenses um, are able to be offset by allowing them to work in seasonal temporary jobs here in the US. So these, this is a mutually beneficial program. The students get to come here, work temporarily in the US and help defray a portion of their expenses for coming on the program and traveling around the US. Um, and as uh, many of you guys might be aware, these past two summers have presented some uh, unique challenges to this program and our world as a whole. Um, our overseas consulates um, and embassies have been operating at limited capacities, um, as well as other local COVID restrictions, which have caused significant backlogs to some more travel visa appointments last summer and the summer before. Um, this summer, we've seen a resurgence of the summer travel program, and we've gotten much, much closer to uh, pre-pandemic numbers, which is very positive. Visa processing has progressed smoothly for the most part with some exceptions um, at some US consular posts overseas. Um, and I don't wanna get too in the weeds here, but you guys might've read some of those um, headlines making newspapers last year about visa processing delays. So I wanted to give a quick update on that. Things are looking very positive. Um, uh, there are the regional specific travel bans have been lifted, um, and I, uh, as most people are probably aware, there are there is a vaccine requirement currently in place for any international travelers coming to the U.S. that includes all participants on the program. Um, that that is in effect currently, and for our upcoming winter program, and unless anything changes, will be in effect for the summer program next year. Um, there aren't currently any COVID-19 uh, testing requirements. Those were lifted by uh, the administration. Um, so as you can see, uh, we're not quite where we were in 2019 participant numbers, but we're much closer than the last two years. Um, this is very positive and we're really excited to welcome our students for this upcoming winter season. We have a winter program with students primarily from the Southern Hemisphere, um, uh, including Chile, um, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Peru, and a number of other Southern Hemisphere countries. And they're coming typically to the more ski destinations, the winter tourism destinations, and then working a lot of the ski operations. Um, this chart also doesn't include the winter program, which is anticipated to be one of the largest in recent years. So we're looking at uh, a nearly rebounded program after the last few years, which is very positive. And uh, demand for the program has stayed high through the last few years, um, you know, for both hosts and participants. Participants still wanna come to the, to the US on these programs. Hosts still want to host the participants. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of support um, in Congress. I'm not gonna get into the weeds on some of the advocacy we do, um, but we do work with a lot of our host employers and our partner uh, business associations on making sure that this program continues to have bipartisan support like it has um, throughout its duration. The program is you know, over 50 years old um, and it's always had support in Congress and we work with you know, a lot of our partners to make sure that it continues to have that support in the future. Um, so if we do work with any of you guys as, as host employers and businesses, sometimes we do work with you on you know, outreach to our congressional leaders to make sure that the program continues um, in a robust way in the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass this off to my colleague, Portia, who can talk a little bit more about becoming a host employer and some of the background um, involved in that. Thank you, Clay. Um, so uh, new to hiring through the summer work travel program. So for those of you who are new to the program, um, here are just a few things um, to consider. Um, Beginning with our timeline, after you've matched with a participant, uh, they will need to take their DS-2019 form to a U.S. embassy or a consulate in their home country to apply for their visa and then book their plane tickets to America. Uh, you, as the um, host employer, will then be able to track their flight through our online matching system and um, their visa status um, in your account. So uh, the requirements are um, 
seasonality, um, first and foremost. Um, and it must not displace American workers and the pay must uh, consumerate with US counterparts. Um, um, as Tracy mentioned, housing is a critical component of the program. Uh, we are asking all of our hosts to provide housing or to arrange housing prior to a participant's arrival. This can come in many forms. You do not have to own your own housing. Um, uh, participants usually expect to pay rent while they are here on the program. Uh, unfortunately, sponsor, sponsors have had to pull out of some areas where there is a lack of housing. Uh, keeping in direct contact with your visa sponsor is critical. You can also look on the participants DS 2019 form for the sponsor name. Uh, if a participant should come to you second job, um, please find out who their sponsor is. And if they don't know, um, ask to see their DS 2019 form and contact the sponsor to go through their approval process. Uh, please keep in mind that all second jobs must be approved by the sponsor before the student can start working. Uh, then we have, uh, so what does InterExchange do for our host employers? As your dedicated account manager, I can help with any questions throughout the entire process. Uh, we do have a, a 24 hour emergency cell phone should there be anything that impacts your participants' health, safety, or welfare. And next we have, um, going back to our online matching system. Uh, the online matching system allows for you as the employer to create your host employer profile, post job listings, photos of your business and housing. You can then search and match with participants. After a participant is hired, you can view real-time info, such as their visa status, again, their flight information for your future employers. And lastly, um, what does InterExchange do for our participants? Well, we are a nonprofit, so we keep our costs for participants low. Uh, all students go through a thorough orientation prior to their arrival that covers what to expect, American currency, and many other topics. All students have comprehensive accident sickness insurance that go above and beyond what the State Department requires. We have a 24 hour emergency cell phone should there be anything that impacts your participants um, health, safety or welfare. Again, it's just that enough. Um, we are here to help both our employers, our host employers and our participants. So, um, you know, feel free to keep in contact with me, um, you know, with any questions or, or concerns. And um, I just want to add one thing on timing. Um, you know, we have, uh, as I mentioned, our winter program is about to get underway, but we've already started matching for our summer program for next summer. Um, we opened up our matching system just a, a week or two ago. So we're right at the beginning of our, our season for recruiting for next summer. Um, we do do that on a rolling basis between now and the beginning of spring. Um, there's no definitive timeline. Our participants are applying for the program on a rolling basis. Um, so we have a number of participants that have chosen that they want to come on the program already. We'll have more, you know, throughout the holidays and a little bit after the holidays. So we have thousands of students that participate in the program every year and they apply on a rolling basis and thus can be matched with an, an employer on a rolling basis. Um, so once you're set up with an account and as you as uh, Portia mentioned, you know, you can update your business description, pictures, photos of the business, kind of advertise the business. That's how you advertise kind of your openings to our participants. Um, once you know, once you go in there and you have those listings open, the students can apply directly to your open positions, but you can also look at the grouping of students that are available to hire and offer jobs and or set up interviews directly through the app with those students as well. Um, and if you don't see the right students right off the bat, you know, they are applying on a rolling basis. If you check back next week, there'll be a whole new batch of students that have come into the system as well. Um, we usually close our um, matching sometime in uh, March or April, though we often do last minute placements, you know, into May. Um, students typically arrive, start arriving in May and arrivals can, you know, last through July, um, depending on the, where the student's coming from. The dates that they can participate in the program are set by U.S. embassies overseas based on national university dates. So some students can arrive in the beginning of May and stay three to four months. Some students don't arrive until June or even early July, but can stay into the shoulder season into October. 
Um, so a lot of our host employers do stagger their arrivals um, based on their needs and when their peak business needs are. And I'm happy to take any questions as well. If anybody has any, you know, specific questions on how the program works, um, you know, background on, uh, on, you know, the best tips and, and things to get started with the program as well. I do you want to talk a little bit about um, costs to businesses who want to be a sponsor or host employer? Sure. There's uh, there's no cost to businesses that want to participate in the program. So the program is free for businesses. Um, you know, uh, that being said, this is a cultural exchange program. We want to make sure to set up a good program for all of the participants, make sure that they feel welcomed, um, make sure that they have access to some of the fun, you know, cultural activities that there are in your area, getting out to the mountains, you know, seeing some of the activities that they have around in the area. Um, so there are costs in that you have to kind of set up a program and manage a, a separate program for some of the international students, but there's no direct financial costs. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have, they, all the students do have to apply for a social security number when they first arrive in the US. So they all have a social security number when they arrive for tax reporting purposes. Um, they don't pay um, social security or Medicare taxes, just state, federal and local taxes. Um, that's really the only difference between, you know, hiring a US-based staff and hiring one of um, the participants on the summer travel program, um, as far as tax reporting goes. Um, so there's no costs to the employers, um, but, you know, we do want to make sure that the program is set up well for the students, that they have access, as Portia mentioned, to, um, you know, safe and affordable housing that meets all codes and ordinances locally, um, and that they have access to reliable and safe transportation. They have a way to get to and from work and also a way to get, you know, to and from, you know, infrastructure like the grocery store and, you know, other, you know, things that they might want to do in town, um, restaurants and shopping and things like that. So they have to have access to some kind of transportation in the area, which I know there's a good bus system um, kind of around where you guys are. Um, and also, you know, access to, you know, housing um, and cultural activities in the area. Right. And just to let those on the call know, that's where UVBA thought that we might be able to be helpful is to help plan some of those cultural activities, coordinate transportation to go get their social security cards. And then uh, as a group, we can talk about how we might be able to address some sort of collaborative housing or housing options. So why don't we open it up for any questions to Clay and Portia and uh, Clay, I'm, I'm just going to have you stop sharing your screen so that we can see everybody. So in really quickly, um, my first question is when an employer, if an employer is of interest and they want to go through the process. Do they need to like contract with inter with InterExchange or how, do they just go on a website and start creating a profile? And then do your students, do they literally, is it like a, almost like a catalog for them? They can pick what area they want to go to and what they want to do. Or is it more vice versa where we choose, where the employer chooses the student? How does that work? Two, two very good questions. Um, I'll start with the first question. Um, so you'll, you know, you can reach out to Portia or myself and we can set you up with an account where you can add all of your business information. There is a uh, vetting process that we have to go through. We have to collect a business license, proof of um, active workers comp insurance that covers the participants and all of your staff. Um, the State Department, you know, has a list of different requirements that we have to verify to make sure that the jobs meet the seasonality requirements, meet, you know, a variety of other requirements that they're you know, um, they're not allowed to work overnight shifts predominantly between the hours of 10, 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Um, there's a few other requirements like that. That's kind of one of the most impactful ones. They can work, say, till 11 or 12. They just can't do the night shift um, at any business. Um, and there's a number of other requirements like that that we have to make sure that the jobs um, and the businesses meet. Um, you'll sign a host employer agreement um, when you are creating your application. Um, it's pretty, it's not binding as far as, you know, the jobs that you're offering. Um, 
you know, if you offer a participant a uh, job, we ask that you make a good faith effort to meet all of the uh, job requirements um, and job offer, uh, you know, the wage, the salary, the amount of hours that you're offering. Um, we are looking for full-time positions, um, averaging at least 32 hours a week. Now we understand, you know, a lot of your businesses are seasonal in nature and some weeks might be busier than others. So, you know, over the course of the season, we are looking for each position to average at least 32 hours. Um, and that's just that the participants can, you know, afford to pay the housing, the transportation, save up some money for their travels. Um, and the second part of your question, uh, it works both ways. So kind of that's the, the benefit of the online matching system that Portia was talking about. You can post your job listings um, and participants will be able to see photos of your business, a description of the area. You know, we we advise that you put as much detail as you can into that. Um, you know, what there is to do in the area, what to expect, you know, when the participants are coming, um, you know, what the specifics of the job entail, um, you know, are there uniform requirements, anything like that. Um, and then participants can kind of see all of those active listings across the United States. So you are kind of in a way competing with other regions around the U.S. Um, but, you know, participants refer to the area and they can see your open listings and apply directly with you if you want to set up an interview with them. That's great. Um, we highly recommend that in a lot of cases because it really helps set those expectations and, you know, they can kind of see a face on your end, you can see their face on their end and, and really gauge their English um, a little bit better. Um, all of the participants do have a YouTube um, video introduction in their applications. Um, so the second way that it works is that you can kind of, you can see all of the participants, a list of all the participants that have chosen your area and your job types as something they might be interested in. So you're not going to see participants that absolutely only want to go to the West Coast or only want to go to, say, Florida. You're going to see participants that have chosen your region as an area they're okay going to um, and job types that they're interested in. Um, and they can see some information about your business and then they can apply directly with you and they'll go into your on review list. Um, participants kind of, uh, whether you put them on review with your business or whether they put themselves on review with your business, they're on review for three days. Um, if you reach out to Portia, we can always extend that if you need more time to set up an interview. Um, but then it gives both of you guys an opportunity to view each other's information, kind of see if they think it'll be a good fit, set up an interview um, if you'd like. Um, you'll have an opportunity then to, you know, check out their application. It has their work history, their hobbies, you know, what they're studying in school, view their video and all of that and see if it's a good candidate to set up an interview with or to hire. Um, and then you can just offer a position directly through the system as well. And then there's another level. Once you offer a position to the student, they need to sign, you know, the the offer and then it'll go back to you and then it'll go you know through us we have to make sure that you know everything meets all of the requirements um, and then I think as Portia mentioned once an offer has been made and everything is approved and has been signed off on the students get issued their DS 2019 form and that's a, uh, a state department issued a homeland security issued sorry uh, form that has all of the job details all of their sponsor details which is our information they take that form with them for um, a, uh, an interview at, the, at a US embassy or consulate in their home country. And they interview, they get their visa, and then they can start booking their flights and prepping for their travel. I have a couple of, of questions. Sure. So um, I am with uh, Kendall at Hanover. We're um, a retirement care uh, community. And so think of it as a cross between Grand Hotel meets um, healthcare, mm -hmm. <laughs> nursing home. We have a lot of requirements for all of our staff relative mm -hmm. to, to meeting healthcare regulations, uh, requiring um, uh, pre employment physicals, drug testing, um, uh, um, certain immunizations, that type of mm -hmm. thing. Is that something that we can work together to get that accomplished? Yes, I'd say um, let's set up a call maybe and chat okay. about some of the requirements to see. Um, you know, we do have a lot of um, our hosts that do require drug testing and other have other kinds of requirements. So, um, 
you know, that's something, you know, that's not new to us, um, depending on the set of requirements, um, you know, that might be specific. So we can probably set up a call to chat through some of those requirements and see if it might be a good fit. Great. My other question is uh, relative to the list of um, potential restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. We have, we, I could envision a number of opportunities, but um, understanding the limitations would be very helpful to make sure yes. that we would be providing yeah. opportunities yeah. which complied. Yeah, some of the, some of the big ones aside from you know working a night shift, um, participants are not allowed to drive vehicles that a license is required um, uh, as part of their job. Um, some participants do have an international driver's license and can drive in their off time. Um, so that's one of the limitations. Um, sustained physical contact, um, you know, um, is another uh, requirement. Um, so they can't do tattooing or body piercing or anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, and we can go over any other requirements as well too, just to make sure that's clear. Is there a list that you can share? Yes, there is, yeah. I can actually show that right now. Share of those kind of in it or is that on a website or portal? Yeah, it's on our website. I'll I'll shoot a link out to this uh, chat actually in just a second. Thank you. Clay, I'm a little unclear on the difference between a sponsor and a host. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so a host employer is going to be somebody that's that's offering a position to the student and with whom the student is going to be working and spending their program. Um, we're going to be a sponsor agency, so our job is to administer the program. Um, you know, make sure that all the jobs uh, meet the requirements, provide the students with insurance and assistance throughout their entire programs, um, and help facilitate a lot of the back end of all the program. Um, so we'll be the first point of contact that you'll want to go to if there's any issues, you know, with the participant, if they're, you know, maybe homesick, anything like that. We have staff on hand that can help assist all aspects of, you know, the participants program while they're here in the country. Um, your job as a host is essentially to offer them a position, um, you know, make them feel welcome in the community and kind of work with them on the ground, you know, as, as a host of the participant on the ground. So is that cleared up? Yeah, yeah, got it. So you're, yeah. you're the sponsor, we're the host. Um, yep. And then my understanding is the, the school year is a little different than the, the school year here. And that yes. um, you know, uh, I was talking to our GM who has done this many times. Uh, at a previous company and he was he was telling me that you know students in the U.S. typically are going back to school in uh in early September but a lot of times these students are able to work through through September potentially into yep. October even even into November is that um that, you know my understanding is this is a six-month visa and we're kind of working around the school year so I, I know you mentioned kind of uh offsetting yeah. when people would come and stuff like that. But what, what, what are the typical times you're seeing for, uh, for these students coming in? Yeah, so two, two things to note. One, it's um, the program has a cap of four months as far as the work portion of the student's program. So um, by program regulations that are set by the Department of State, um, students can't work more than four months on their program and then travel up to a month. That being said, Many of the participants, the average is around three months based on their university dates. Um, if you check the chat box, I just dropped two links, one um, with the job requirements and the second one is student availability. This is not a comprehensive list um, of all of the parts. We have students from 60 or more different countries every year, um, but this is some of the more popular countries and where those students are coming from. And you'll see the, the work dates that earliest arrival and departure by date, those are the dates set by the US embassies, meaning a student from Albania, the earliest they can arrive is July 15th and the latest they can work is October 15th. That being said, depending on the student's final exam schedule or their class schedule, that might be slightly different and within those dates. So some, some students might have to return home a week earlier due to their classes you know, starting I'm at the university and you should, you know, add those are questions to ask in the interview when you're speaking with students, though they have their dates listed in the system, you'll see the dates listed in the system. 
And they all fall within these two dates, date ranges, depending on the country they're coming from. Um, but some of them might be a little bit shorter depending on their class schedule and when they're expected back at university. Um, so yeah, four months is the cap. I would say three months is the average. Um, some students stay you know, a full four months and work a full four months, some a little bit less. Um, and within those date ranges, if that helps. So really quickly on that question. So the date range is the work time, not their entire visit. Time. Correct, correct, yeah. So this date range is their work time and then they're granted um, up to a month of uh, time afterwards with, with which they can sightsee. Um, and I say up to a month because the big caveat is they still have to be back for their start of their classes. Um, so they are expected to be back, you know, in time to start their classes in the fall semester. Um, so some students might only travel for two weeks at the end of their program. Some students might travel for a month. Um, also, personal preference, some students might only want to travel for a couple weeks or a week um, and then return home. So, yeah, those are the, the work, the work dates that they can come. And on the, the profile, when the employer sets up a profile, would you suggest if they've had students before that they maybe have the students that they had prior, like, you know, review the how their experience was with the business or was that valuable? Was that like something that the other prospective students would appreciate to see? Yeah, I think that is something that they would definitely be interested in seeing. Um, you know, I think also what you find is if you've had if you've hired students before and they've had a great experience, they're going to go home and they're going to tell some of their friends and tell some of their, you know, um, siblings and other, you know, friends at, at, at their university and say, hey, this is a great experience. But yes, I think, you know, that um, that firsthand experience is definitely valuable. And that's something you, you know, might want to share quotes or, you know, stories of participants, maybe even in the photos section, if the participants are okay with, you know, sharing the photos and things like that. Um, you know, I think that all, all helps kind of build it up. Um, Remembering, uh, you know, students are not just looking at the job details, how much they're making per hour, um, you know, how much the housing cost is. They're looking at, you know, kind of the whole picture of, you know, am I going to have a good experience there? What is there to do in town? Is there any kind of nightlife if they're interested in that? Or are there any kind of like outdoor recreation activities, you know, they, they might be interested in anything like that that can help, you know, kind of describe the area. Remembering that, you know, if you're a student studying, you know, in Romania, and you're looking at coming to, you know, New Hampshire or Maine, you know, or Vermont, you know, what is there to do in the area? They might not be familiar with the ge geography of the area and what there is to do in the area. So the more details, the better to kind of bolster that, um, that listing. Yeah. Clay, do you want to um, tell Just us a to, little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Does someone have a question? I did, but go ahead. If there's a way we could put together kind of a regional posting that talks about what's available in the region that we could all refer back to, that may be helpful. Yeah, Jody, and that that's exactly why uh, UVBA wanted to do this presentation is we were we were thinking that we may be able to, to do that for our businesses who wanna participate is arrange some, some cultural trips, um, you know, maybe take the students over to Hampton Beach one day or to the mountains another day, do, you know, arrange the transportation and do this on a collaborative basis, which would help all of you and spread the costs around and, you know, and just make it a little, take that piece of it off your plate. Um, if businesses are interested in doing that. Um, Clay, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what you've done with New Hampshire? You had told me, I think the North Conway area typically has about what, 3,000 3, J1s come on an annual basis? I think the North Conway area has about a thousand students that come on an annual basis. Um, and uh, so we've been working with their chamber up there on, you know, doing some cultural events and, and getting this together um, out in Massachusetts as well. Cape Ann Peninsula. Um, we've been working closely with one of their business alliances and communities on setting up um, housing and cultural events for the students and um, uh, discounts on some of the bus transportation um, so that the students have discounts on the bus transportation throughout the area and partnering with all the businesses out there to kind of set that up. Um, and then we get essentially a boilerplate kind of at, 
um, uh, Jody, as you kind of mentioned, a boilerplate set of information that we can have each host share with the students on what there is to do in the area um, and some of these events. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, you know, these students are coming, you know, to gain, uh, you know, a fun experience here in the US. So an opportunity for them to meet all of the other participants in the area is great. You know, they want to make friends, they're college students that, you know, are here on an exchange program and they want to make friends and have a good time while they're here. So an opportunity for them to meet all the other students in the area is great. And also, you know, working with your individual staffs too, to make sure that they're aware of the program and that they're aware of, you know, the participants, why they're coming on the program. And oftentimes, you know, the students will make friends with a lot of your other staff members um, who might, you know, take them under their wing and take them out, you know, on some, uh, you know, uh, you know, events and trips and stuff um, on their own as well. So, you know, working with both your staff and with the Business Alliance on, you know, uh, ways to integrate the students and make sure that they feel, you know, part of the community. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions for Clay or Portia? Well, I just, I guess timeline wise, what we had talked about. So if this is something that a business had, had an interest in pursuing for the summer 2023 term, it would be advantageous for them to kind of get on the page and like build something and get started on that sooner rather than later. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Yeah. I would uh, send Portia or myself an email um, as soon as you, you know, you think you might be interested and we can set up a call to kind of go over some of the details, answer any more questions, set up a page for you, um, okay. kind of explain how it works. There's a lot of tutorials kind of built in as well on how, you know, the actual application works and all of that. Um, and we can also, you know, answer other questions. But yeah, I would I would start it as early as possible. It can take some time, you know, just to get some of that set up right. um, before you're actually matching with students. Um, and again, you know, you don't have to have everybody hired by the new year, but, you know, getting that process started early so that, you know, you don't want to be too far behind the ball in, you know, February, the bulk of the students have been hired. You know, if we have 10,000 students a year, you know, and the bulk of them have been hired by February, there's only going to be, you know, a smaller subset, you know, left to hire, you know, right. towards the spring. So, yeah. Right. Right. I think, I mean, I can, I'm just going to go out on a limb and speak for pretty much everybody here from the Upper Valley that's on this call. I mean, I think our biggest concern would be trying to find, you know, making sure that the housing was available to them, you know, making sure that the transportation was available, things like that. So I think that would be, I'm sure that the businesses in the area would have a huge interest in the program. It's just a matter of making sure that we can satisfy all the logistical requirements. Yep. Yep, and Jennifer, I, I did want to add that, um, um, you know, as Clay mentioned, we are just kind of getting started. So it, it is, it is a, definitely a good, a good time to kind of get the ball rolling with, you know, applying, submitting an application and starting um, with your hiring process. Um, but the, the earlier, the better, especially, you know, so that students can kind of get a head start with applying, you know, um, making their visa appointments, applying for their visas. Um, you know, arranging their travel and all of that. So definitely the, the earlier, the better. Right. And I'm assuming the YouTube video that you said that's part of their application process is probably a great way for the perspective, perspective host to be able to see that they do have, you know, strong enough English, you know, being able to, to come here and participate. And, and oh, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I think that's, you know, the the videos help, you know, gauge the English levels and also kind of the personality, make sure they might be a good fit. Um, I always suggest setting up an interview afterwards, you know, a Skype or Zoom or, you know, Google Meet interview afterwards, um, just to, you know, further, you know, gauge their English and make sure that they're going to be a good fit. Um, one of the things that really helps make the program succeed too is expectation setting. Um, so making sure that the students have realistic expectations about where they're going, what the job, you know, is going to entail and all of that. So, you know, again, you know, the more opportunities you have to get in front of the students and really set those expectations right off the bat, the, the better a success it's going to be so that they know before they take the job, you know, what, what they're getting into. Right, right. So is there a way in the matching program too, to be able to see if there are any students that are 
getting a secondary education in the field that our business is in to maybe see if that's, you know, would make for a great match. Yeah, you'll see what they're studying in the matching system and, you know, what, what, the, what jobs they've had to previously, um, you know, what their work experience is, kind of like a resume. Um, so you'll see all of that. Um, also, some of the students are returning and might have been on the program before and are coming back a second or even a third um, summer. Um, so some of the students might have been on the program before, might have already had some experience in, you know, your respective businesses um, if they've been on the program before. And you'll see that in the system as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And well, um, by just I, looking at some of these dates, uh, like Ecuador, 20 mm -hmm. January to one October, but we have to pick a four month period within that period, right? Yeah, Ecuador okay. is actually a unique in that um, they have their their country has their each university in their country has a summer break at a different period of time. Mm. Um, so unlike, you know, kind of a lot of countries where most of the universities kind of partner together to say, hey, this is when our general summer vacations are going to be. Um, Ecuador has changed their system. So some of the participants have, you know, an early summer break and some have a later. So it's not really as much about choosing when they're coming. It's about when their universities within that time frame have their summer break. Um, in the system, you'll see the dates that each individual participant can come. And you can actually sort all of the participants based on their arrival date or their departure date. So you can kind of filter that out and say, hey, I really need somebody to arrive, you know, by May 15th or by May 1st. You know, that's a, a key priority for me. And you can put in those parameters and say, you know, May 1st to May 30th is, you know, the arrival date I need for these participants. And it'll filter out all the students um, to see which one, which students can arrive those dates and same with the departure dates as well. Um, there used to be a much more robust spring program. Um, and Thailand actually used to also have, you know, the bulk of their um, university dates in our spring. Um, they've moved um, to most of their universities over to kind of um, coincide with the rest of uh, Western university dates. So those are really just set, those dates are set by universities and by embassies in those countries um, that are evaluating university dates. And Tracy, are we going to do a follow up meeting to talk about what the UVBA is going to be thinking about doing? Yeah, that that would be what my proposal is to everyone on here is we'll we'll pick another date. We'll have a follow up. We'll talk about how we can do this on you know a collaborative basis, which I think would be helpful for everybody. Um, so really, this was to introduce you to inter exchange and the possibility what the process is. And then if you're interested in moving forward, let me know and we'll we'll have that other uh, meeting and and go to the next step. Thank you, Clay and Portia. Yeah, thank you thank guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, I, I have recorded this, so I, I know we had some people that expressed interest and then we're not able to be here. Um, so we will have the recording available, or if you want to see it again as well, um, Clay and Portia, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I'm, I see some heads nodding, so I think there may be some interest, and uh, I'm sure we're going to be in touch. Thank you so much, Tracy. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Bye, you, Tracy. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Tracy, for hosting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good to see you again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How do I stop recording?